Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome here. It's, uh, it's been a little while since I was able to, to preach here last, and so a few things have happened since then. Probably the best would be this. <laughs> Got married at the end of December, which has been amazing, and we've just been having so much fun. My wife, Julie, she'll be here for the, during the third service, but it's been so fun to start this new season of our lives together, and you learn all sorts of cool things when you get married, like, for example, this shirt apparently is not pink, it's coral. I didn't know that. <laughs> But we've been having so much fun enjoying this season together and getting to know each other more and, and adjusting to life as a married couple and, and also in this church together. And so that's been a blast. And, and this week, actually, it was really, really cool. On Thursday, we had the, the third GMDS class of students graduate. And, um, and it was just such an amazing time. And, and there's a bunch of people who came. And honestly, I wish you all could have been there. I actually feel a little bit bad for you because this is, this is our church's school um, but I'm the one who got to see it for eight months in a row, every day, as a, as a Holy Spirit was doing a, a work in the lives of these students. And, and I, I'm not here to brag about this school, but I do want to brag about Jesus, because, my goodness, <laughs> he's amazing. And I, and I watched students over a, over a course of eight months as the Lord brought deliverance into their lives, greater freedom into their lives, greater courage into their lives. I got to watch students step out in the power of the Holy Spirit. We were actually at a, at a youth conference about a month ago, and one of our students prayed for the speaker at the conference, and his back was healed. And the guys, he was just so grateful for the power of God. And so again and again and again, we got to see what happens when, when people just get in front of the Word of God and allow to transform their lives. And, and I'm, I'm such a big proponent of, of, of what God does in, in things like GMDS because I've, you know, I've, I've spoken at so many youth retreats over the years and been at so many different events, and I'm convinced the reason why those things are often so powerful is that whenever we set aside a larger chunk of time with God, it bears fruit in our lives. It, it just bears fruit in our lives. And so watching the Holy Spirit move has been just absolutely amazing. And, and I could tell you story after story after story. I could take up the whole morning easily telling you stories of what the Lord has done. But, but I am just so stirred and encouraged by what the Lord's doing here. And, and he's, he's up to something. I know like last year at this point, we had, we had 10 students who graduated. But last year at this point, we didn't have a single application. And we already have 11. And... And I'm just saying, Lord, send, send the hungry ones. Send the ones who want more of you. Send the ones who aren't sure what they're doing in their lives. God, send every single one that you want to have here. Because this is not about building a school. We don't care about the school. It's about building a kingdom. And it's about seeing the Lord raise up a generation who's on fire for him. And I, I mentioned earlier, just about a month ago, we had a chance to go to a, a youth conference, and our, our students were serving at the youth conference, helping out in the kitchen, helping out with organization, just helping things to flow. And, and for me, it was such an amazing time because the conference was in Saskatchewan. I got to meet with friends of mine and reconnect with friends from Edmonton and Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, just across the prairies, really. And, and be reminded again that what God is doing is so much bigger than Winkler. Like all across our nation, he's, he's breathing on people who are hungry for him, who are wanting to see his kingdom move forward in power. There's, there's no shortage of power on God's end. What he's looking for is people who will have open hearts and say, yes, God, I want everything you have for me. And so that, that stirs me when we look at our nation. It stirs me because we only hear the bad news. But God is actually up to something really, really good. And, and, and even a, a number of weeks ago we, when we had our AGM and, and Pastor Claude was talking a bit about the vision and about, you know, about mending our nets and getting ready for a harvest, I just I felt my heart stirring. Because I, I, I have this, this sense as he was talking, it's like the Lord, he's about to transition us, I believe, into another season. And, it, and it's a buckle up your seatbelts, all hands on deck, and let's sow, not into, you know, we want, we want to sow into this church, but the reason we want to sow into this church is because we want to sow into what God is doing. It's about his kingdom. And it's about his son being glorified. And so, I just feel like this is such an exciting time to be connected to his kingdom. And yeah, I know that, that if we could go through the church, there's, there's many stories in the midst of that of like, 
of, of need and like, oh, Lord, will you break in? Or, Lord, I want a testimony of that too. And so as a church, we want to continue to contend together to see his spirit move here in our community. Let's pray and we'll, we'll get into the message. I think it's already sort of started. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. There's no one like you. And I thank you that you're more than words on a page. You're more than a concept. You're more than an idea. You're a real man who's fully God, seated at the right hand of the Father. And you're on the move in this generation. And God, we we want to hitch our carts to you. We want to to hitch our lives, connect our lives to you. And we want to follow you. We want to be with you where you are. We want to do what you're doing. We want to pray what you're praying. We want to look at our community and those around us and see what you're seeing. And so God, I ask that you would even take us into a whole new level of intimacy with you as we join with you in the things that are on your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I I don't remember loads about the last sermon that that I preached here, but I do remember this phrase, and it's funny because it was the exact same phrase I wanted to, to start with today, and it's simply this, that Jesus changes everything. And I believe the Lord wants to take us as a church back into a deeper revelation of the power and glory of the simple gospel. Christ crucified for our sins, raised to life on the third day to give the promise of redemption and eternal life to all who would follow him and put their trust in him. And I believe the Lord wants to bring us back to the reality and glory of this thing that we've been called to. Because there's, there's a good number of people here who are similar to me and we, we grew up in the church and we've heard the gospel so many times that, that what can happen is we actually start to get dull to its brilliance. We can, we can start to get dull to the reality and glory of this thing that, that, that we've been called to. And we forget that we have the best news on the planet. And even in this region, there are thousands of people, thousands in this Pemina Valley region, who are longing to actually hear the good news of Jesus. And yeah, maybe they've heard about Jesus before, but they've never met him. They've never had an encounter with this one who gave his life for their sins. And there's something so glorious, and again, I I gotta see it again and again throughout this year, there's something so glorious about this Jesus who came to set the captives free. There's something so glorious about this Jesus who actually takes a deep interest in your life and he cares about the things that you're going through and he cares about the things that your family are walking through. He cares about the wounds that are inside of your heart and he wants to see you healed and set free and brought into deeper relationship with you. He wants to see you strengthened. I often tell my students that that being a Christian is is not a guarantee that you're never going to face any hard times. Because everybody faces hard times. Everybody, whether you're a believer or not, we all walk through hard times. What it is a guarantee of is that you're never going to walk alone. You're never going to walk alone. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. And we have a hope that the world needs to hear. On Easter, Pastor Claude, he was talking about just this glory of this, of this message of the cross. And, and one of the things that he pointed out is that the only right response to the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross is surrender. That we give him our everything. And from time to time, I think maybe more than from time to time, it's good for us to remember what he saved us from. 
It's good to remember the power of the blood of Jesus that, that set me free. That set you free. One of my students said just a, a really like, amazing thing this year, and it, and it kind of stuck with me because we were talking about like, the Holy Spirit working, in, and, and as, as she was experiencing the, the Spirit working through her, she just made this statement, like, it, this, like, why would he do this? This doesn't make sense. And she was struck, like, why would God use me? This doesn't make any sense. And I said, that's exactly the point of the gospel. It actually doesn't make sense that God himself would die in my place. Right, all of my sin, all of my rebellion, all those things that I knew better than to do and I did anyway, that he would die in my place and he would make me clean. And if that doesn't cause you somewhere on the inside of you to want to jump for joy, you're probably not actually understanding what the gospel is. This gospel is good news. And, and Jesus in, in Matthew 22, it's, it's kind of cool because the, the Pharisees are trying to trap him. And in the process of trying to trap him, he actually gives us the mandate, I believe, of what it means to walk out the Christian life. He's like, oh, you're trying to trap me. Well, I'm going to give one of my most brilliant teachings. And all of his teachings are brilliant, but this is one of them. And he says this, they're asking, like, what's the most important commandment? And another way of saying this is, how do we respond properly to God? How do we respond properly to the cross? You could ask that same question here. And Jesus says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I, I love like the glory of, of what it means to walk out life as a follower of Jesus. Jesus says, it's, it's pretty simple, actually. Here's the first thing you do. I bled and died to pay the penalty for your sins. I've loved you fully. Just love me in return. Love me with all you have. Love me in the same way I love you. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> I can do that, Jesus. You're so kind, you're so gracious, you're so gentle. Like, okay, so, so we're, we're called to, to walk in love to God and that, and that as a church is a foundation. This is what we're here for primarily. This is our number one thing that we're called to do is to love Jesus with all of our strength. It's to love him with everything that he has. He's the reason for this church. This church does not exist for, for me. It doesn't exist for you. It exists primarily actually for him because he's given us everything. And so our central mandate then becomes is to love and worship him with all that we have. And, and I love that. He says it's the first and greatest commandment. And then he says, but there's a second commandment and it's like the first. It springs out of the first. And it's this. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And as we continue on today in this series, this is us, a series about relationships. It's the second part of this great commandment that I want to focus on today. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, as, as I've loved you, I want you now to go out and walk in love for other people. We should be known as the most loving people in our community. Right? Winkler should be known as a community of love. A people whose head over heels in love with God and who's walking in love for everyone around us. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And of course, throughout the pages of scripture, it fleshes out in greater detail. But if you're going to boil it down to two things, it's this, is love God with all of your strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and as we're talking about relationships, my, my thought, my key thought for this morning is this. What would happen? What if we approached relationships as if they were part of our response to the gospel itself? What if me and you, we approached the relationships in our lives as if it was part of our, like, like our reaction to the gospel, as if, as if they were part of our reaction to what Jesus did for us on the cross? If you have your Bible with you, turn with me to John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. It'll pop up on the screen as well. I love John chapter 15. We keep coming back to it like a GMDS. We keep coming back to this over and over and over again. Because every time I really study this passage, there's other facets that stick out to me. And it's like, 
oh, I barely understand this. I keep using the language of, again, if, if John chapter 15 is an ocean, I, I'm, I'm somewhere on the kiddie pool of, of understanding the depths of all that's going on. But in John 15, 9 to 17, Jesus, what he's doing in these passages, all the way from John 13 to 17, is he's teaching his disciples and he's about to go to the Father. He's about to be crucified. And so he's giving them some of his key teachings to, to solidify their faith in him, to prepare them for all that's to come. So this stuff that, that he's saying is all just deeply important to his heart. And, and he says this, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Which, okay, I, I, already I absolutely love this. Jesus loves you the same way the Father loves him. With the same depth and intensity that the Father loves the Son, Jesus loves you. This is the starting point of everything else he's about to say. That God in heaven loves you with every fiber of his being. And then he says, now, now I want you to remain in my love. He said, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. In a way, what he's saying is this is, hey, if you want to walk in intimacy, intimacy with me, you actually have to walk in the same direction I'm walking in, right? I've, I've done this illustration before, but, but you can't say, you can't walk in intimacy with Jesus if Jesus is over there and you're walking over here. So he says, you need to obey my commandments. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. We, we actually have to be walking in the same direction. I get that, Jesus. And then he, he goes on and he says, I have told you this so that you may be, so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus, he's, he's coming down to the core of what it means to walk out the Christian life. We receive his love, we understand his love, and he says, now here's my command. I want you to love each other as I have loved you. I want you to love each other with the same intensity that I have loved you. And in case we're confused, he keeps on going, like, and he says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's Christianity. We're walking in obedience to Jesus and we're loving each other, laying down our lives for each other. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. I, I honestly believe the more I read this passage, that this, that this call of friends, I believe it's an invitation for us, but many people say no to it. He says, if you want deep intimacy with me, you gotta love your neighbor. You gotta walk in love with people around us. Then our hearts are gonna be connected. You're gonna be walking as friends, and I, I'm gonna tell you the things of my Father's heart. I think there's an invitation deeper into his heart that only comes as we walk in obedience to him. He says in verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. What would it look like for us as a church to love our neighbors the way that Christ loves us? And, and I've kind of pulled this section out of John 15, but if we would go back to John 15, 1 and read the first eight verses, it's all about abiding in Christ. And, and it's clear from the context of this passage that, that abiding in Christ becomes the foundation of everything else. But what would it look like if we were abiding in Christ, if we were living in, in union, in unity with him, in that place of intimacy, if he was our source of life, if he was our source of strength, if he was our source of affirmation, and out of that connection with him now flows the love of God into every situation, into every relationship that we have, into our workplace, into our marriages, into our families, all across the community. What would that look like? I 
think if we would get our identity, if we would have our faith rooted in Christ, it would free us up from the need for other people's affirmation, for the need of other people's praise, from the need even for other people to like us because we're loved by God. And now out of this, we have this ability like Jesus to love even our enemies, even those who speak ill of us, to, to walk in love. I'm not saying we don't have, shouldn't have healthy boundaries in relationships. But what I am saying is that Jesus expressed a level of love that, that he's calling us right into. And he was asking for mercy on the very ones who are crucifying him. And then Jesus says that this is actually the secret to joy, that this is the secret to our joy being made complete, to first abide in them and then to love others as he loved us. I mean, what a command, what an invitation. And to be honest, at first it almost seems impossible because when, when people wound us, what we're tempted to do is back away. Or when they don't meet our expectations, we're tended to back away. And, and we, we tend to do this thing that I think is probably universal to the human race, but, but I've certainly seen it throughout our community where, where we like to hold on to grudges. And then tell other people about what that person has done against us. We, we, we kind of like to remember and it's just like, well, we'll say, yeah, 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 I forgive you. But actually in our heart, we're like holding on to that, that bitterness or we're holding on to that anger. But I think when we understand the gospel and what Jesus has done for us, it changes our expectations of other people and it changes the way that we're able to respond because we're not giving them love because of something that they've done to us. We're giving them love and walking love towards them because of something Jesus has done for me and for you. And now I'm loving other people out of response to what Jesus has done in my heart. Yeah, they might still be a mess, but Jesus loved me in the depths of my sin and rebellion. Jesus showed mercy to me, and he loved me in the depths of my own like stupidity in decision-making and in, in doing things that were wrong when I knew better. He showed me love and mercy. And because he showed me love and mercy, now through his example, now I, I get to actually imitate my savior and show his love and kindness and mercy to people around me who don't deserve it either. And we start loving them as an overflow of thankfulness to God for what he's done in our lives. In 1 John 4, 19 to 21, John has some intense words for us. And he starts off by saying, we love because he first loved us. It's, it's like he never stopped thinking about what he wrote in John chapter 15. He says, we love because Jesus first loved us. That's why we love. It's why we love God. We love God out of our response to the cross. Jesus started it. We might love God, but Jesus started it. He loved us first. And so we love him in response to that. But we also love other people because God first loved us. He set us the example in Christ of how we're supposed to live our lives. And then he says this. He said, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. <laughs> that's, that's intense, hey? Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. It's like God is saying this. Don't tell me that you love me if you hate my kids. Even my kids that have issues, even my kids that have problems, my kids that I'm wanting to do a work in, my kids that I'm grieving over and I, and I want to see them walking in the right relationship with me. Yeah, I know they're messed up, but, but don't say that you love me and hate them. What a challenge for our lives. But I think the point John is trying to make here is that when we truly understand the love of God for us, we can't help but overflow in love to other people. 
And so if, if, if we're not walking in love towards others, maybe we don't actually know God in the first place. Again, we love people even in the midst of their messiness because that's how Jesus loved us. And if we're walking in hate, and maybe we would never use a language of hate because we're Christians, so we, we call it something else. Like, hey, I'm, I'm going to forgive them, but I'm never going to forget. Maybe we, we call it something else. Yeah, I forgive them, but, but every time we have to gossip about that person, we still do. We, we call it other things. But if we do that, maybe we don't really know God as well as we think we do. Relationships are easier when we view how we treat others as a response to what Jesus did for us on the cross. I want to say that again. Relationships are easier when we view how we treat others as a response to what Christ did for us on a cross. Because suddenly then their response isn't what matters. What matters is my response to Jesus and how I walk it out. I think the cross actually changes so much of how we view our lives. It, it changes our expectations. I'm going to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail here, but, but I think it might be a helpful one because so often we live our lives for ourselves and we, and we, we get like lost kind of in, in, in the confusion and muddle of life. And so I, I think about my own life, for example, and, and for years as someone who, who walked as a, as a single guy, I would see these posts on social media and it would be a, a couple who got married and it would be like, hashtag God is faithful or a, a couple who has a, has a baby and they're like, Hashtag God is faithful. Oh, God's so faithful we had our baby. And, and for 20 years, one of the questions I had to wrestle with from time to time was, well, if God is, if God is faithful when they, have a, when they get married, how about me as, as someone who is, you know, like 30 or 35 or 40 and single? Is he still faithful if I never get married? Or is he still faithful if I never have a kid? Now, the provision of God in our lives is proof of his faithfulness, yes, for sure, but, but I actually think the real proof of God's faithfulness in our lives is the cross. The real proof of his goodness in our lives is the cross. The real root and source of everything in our lives is a cross, and some people are, maybe even here you're thinking, hey, yeah, God, I will follow you completely when you finally give me this, this, or this, and I would say that God's already given you everything through his son. He's given you the forgiveness of sins. He's given you the promise of eternal life. And yeah, in the in-between, there's tension, there's difficulty, there's real struggle, there's real heartache, but, but blink and it's over and you'll be with him for eternity. This is only a vapor. His death on the cross for our sins changes everything. And it's what empowers us to walk in love for others. We are called Gospel Mission Church. We're not called Awesome Worship Mission Church, although like, I love worship here. <laughs> We're not called my Sanctuary Worship Church. I love the sanctuary. We're not called church that has a discipleship school. I really love the discipleship school. We're Gospel Mission Church. And at the center of this church is that message of Christ and him crucified. And coming out of that is that word mission, that, that our response to what Jesus did for us on the cross must actually be tangible in, the, in our relationships and in the lives of those that we encounter around us. There's a joy that comes from knowing that your sins are forgiven, but there's also a real sense of mission. So in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus says this. It's a great commission. He came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Another way you could say this is, as I have loved you, go and love others. You got to tell them about my love. 
It's like Jesus is saying, you got to tell them about my love. you got to tell them about forgiveness of sins. you got to tell them about the joy of turning from ways that lead to death and knowing me. you got to tell them about the way to eternal life. And you've got to walk in love for those people around you. Our relationships are the primary and most effective way that we have of sharing the gospel. So what do your relationships look like? How are we walking towards other people? Guys, I believe that it's on the heart of the Lord to release a move of his spirit that's going to sweep thousands of people into his kingdom. And yeah, the Lord can sovereignly just do that. But often what he does is he works through a church who actually radiates the love of Christ. Radical love. Love that costs us something. Love that's not easy, but is freely given because of what Christ did for us. So what about you? Who are the people Christ is calling you to love? Where are the relationships where the Lord wants to challenge you and say, hey, I want you to love that person the way I loved you. And you're like, ah, but they don't deserve it. And then the Lord's like, yeah, that's exactly the point. I think our community is longing to see the church walk in this kind of love. I, I think they've been looking for it for a long time. And by the grace of God, we want to be those people. So, so let's just stand. I want to pray for us. I say us because I want more of this too. Jesus, we thank you for the gospel. Jesus, we thank you for your blood shed on the cross. Jesus, we thank you that you're the God who loves us in our mess, in our sin, in our brokenness. And God, I ask for a fresh reminder, a fresh encounter of the glory of what you did for us. That you loved us when we were far from you. And then you stayed faithful to us when we sinned, when we went the other way, when we rebelled, when we knew better and we did the wrong thing anyway. You never let us go. You kept walking with us, always believing, always hoping, always drawing us closer to you. And I ask God that you, by your spirit, would put the same love on the inside of us. That we would love our brothers and sisters, we would love our neighbors, even as you have loved us. God, that we would walk out our call to share the gospel with love. That we would walk in relationships with love. And Lord, when it gets hard, when it gets frustrating, when it's like, ah, oh, we, don't, we don't even know what to do anymore, I ask that you would bring us again and again back to the gospel and to your nail-pierced hands and your blood-stained face. And that we would do unto others as you have done unto us. In Jesus' name, amen.